we shucked all 65 oysters on Prince Edward Island last year. We found 65 different brands. Beautiful. I, I know. I was following one. along with us. This is great. And uh, we learned so much. We learned how similar oysters are on Prince Edward Island because of our unique ecosystem, because we are a sandbar, because we don't have strong mineral flavors in our groundwater. But over and over and over again, we learned about the variable brininess, how brininess can change. We had oysters, uh, Conway Narrows, raised one uh, sandbar away from the open ocean, mm -hmm. very briny oysters. We have uh, Dennis's oysters tucked in the bottom of Fortune Bay, lots and lots of fresh water, so not as much of a briny flavor. Think it'll work? Should I get an extra large? If you have I mean, an extra large. I'm just going to run to the kitchen and see if they, you see if they have an extra large. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so what we what we've done now? You've seen the, the spinner that we have. Yeah. So we we chuck a batch. We'll chuck twenty or thirty oysters. Put them in front of the guests. They'll all serve them, and then we spin it again. We have this big spinning wheel that we fill up on the other side while they're filling themselves up on this side. And so every time we spin that wheel, we serve a different oyster, a different oyster from Prince Edward Island. So some nights we'll have five, six, seven different oysters at the bar, and it's become this incredibly interactive. Uh, there's the wheel yeah, there. There's the wheel. You can see how it works. Uh, we'll shuck one side, spin it to the other. Uh, that's two seasons. There it goes. You sort of get the sense of what's up. So we're doing a very active oyster tasting. We have oysters that are grown in the bay directly in front of our restaurant, the legendary Fortune Bay Oyster. Beautiful oyster, super sweet, delicious oyster. But we also like to show off all the other oysters from Prince Edward Island. And and in doing so, it just becomes this really fun, interactive experience. It starts a lot of conversations, and it allows us to really share with people over and over again, hey, this is the essence of an oyster. This is why Prince Edward Island is such a unique place for oysters. It really starts that conversation. So it, it's, it's become a ton of fun. Which is cool as well, because everyone outside of the island understands Malpec. And it's historically known, but breaking it down into the other things as well would be great. So, so what we're doing here today is Chef Michael Smith is having an oyster emergency. I have to rebuild one of these things, custom fit knife, and we're going to use this epoxy putty. We got a little plasti dip. We got the oyster blade. We're going to do it in class. So we're just going to watch the procedure right here. This is how I did it like a hundred years ago. So what it is, when you, when you come up with this idea of if the oyster knife does, or a knife does not fit, I, did, I made a chef's knife, and it's, it's great. It fits the right angle for me to, to chop, but if I wanted to move it around, it doesn't work. No. No. So I kind, of, I kind of abandoned that, but I still have that thing. And you kind of need to move around. But the oyster knife, you need it to stay solidly set in your hand for best practice. Hi, Hi how are you? Good morning. So my idea was that the oyster was too small. Uh, the oyster knife was too small on my hand and I needed to make it a little bit larger, fit my hand specifically if I could do that. And this is how it lent itself to it. Bum, bum, bum. So you take three, three sticks of epoxy putty. Now, once I blend it all together, it took me about 80 tries to get this to work back in the day. So I have this, lovely picture of the let's see i have this picture of the way the story goes this happened 25 years ago at three o'clock <laughs> in the morning chef was great like I, when i open up starfish well, is it is it that's a, it's good it'll work that's perfect actually that'll, that'll be fine da, 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 this one that's the evolution of the oyster knife right there so this is where it came, this is where it starts, the little wooden handle, this, this is the first knife that you use. You can see it's all rusty, non-stainless steel. Everyone will get that, that's a seven dollar Richards knife. So I had this idea right about here, I started with a custom. So I had a knife maker make that for me, which was nice, but it was still too small. This is the first layer. Just looks like a little lump. And it went through three, three phases, it started getting that shape. Then it switched into the yellow, why? Oh, the hardware store ran out of red. <laughs> so when I hit yellow, 
all my countertops were this color, they were black. And I could see it from across the room as, you know, I, well, where's my knife? Oh, there it is over there. So I stuck with yellow all the way. And it evolved in this sense and shape and then the blade shape changes or whatnot. And then this is where the prototype came in and that's where we're at right now. So it's sort of like the evolution of the oyster knife, how it, how it came along. So what we're gonna do, and this is how it's gonna work, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna smush this together. It's gonna take about four minutes to get it to the right shape. I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna form it, then I'm gonna form it to his hand. I'm gonna insert the blade. He's gotta hold on to it, it's gonna get hot. As you know, we'll move the fingers off as we did before. And this is used for underwater welding, isn't it? This is plumber's putty. So, and I used this application down in, in New York when the back bar, there was a water thing and the, put, the, the little sink for a water well was not working. I said, you just need plumber's putty. So I went down to the store, wonk, wonk, put it around, foam, it was wet. It dried solid in spot. And I go, now you can call your plumber. But I got the, the countertop dry, yeah. which was the main thing. So this is a, I, I just figured this out. Plumber's putty, that's the technique. And now Chef likes a bit of a longer blade with a large, so I, I got the blade that he's used to as well. So it's a, my blade evolved over time to where it's this little, this little notch blade thing, which is more competitive and it's a certain size, but he likes something larger. So we're gonna use this one. And that's the depth as far as I wanna get it into. So as we know, and then afterwards, we're just gonna hang it, let it dry in a, in a position so it can dry properly. And then we'll move from there. Uh, does your team need so this is activating right now. There's yeah. chemicals going on here. Kind of, kind of reminds me of uh, horseradish. Um, when you break horseradish, you're breaking the cell walls and you're combining a compound that's in the cell wall with a compound that's in the cell. So when you break, the two compounds combine and create that heat effect that we get from horseradish. So kind of like what's going on here. You can see the color. It's gonna, once it's an even color, then you're at the right moment. And once it becomes even, which is a dark gray, as you can see on the, on the original one, uh, it was this dark gray color. It's evening out quite nice. And then it starts heating up. It gets really, really loose at a certain point. Heats up, and then this is a five minute set, which is it's hot. Fast. I remember that part. It's hot. I remember when I first did it, my <laughs> shop is, He's like, this is this is good, this is fine. Oh, this is hot. Oh, oh! When you get to that point, it's done. Yeah. And then at that point, I go, okay, get out. Okay, we're fine. And I held on to it. And then you just, you know, pretty good. The other thing that's good about the yellow dip is that Chef's got a surgical glove on just because it gets sticky, right? So you don't want it to uh, stick to the hand, etc. I learned that personal. Personally, don't. Gonna be a problem, no, 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 no. Okay. You're on the inside. Inside's good. Inside's good. Um, when it gets to that point, uh, you want it to stick to, not stick to the glove. So you wear gloves for sure. But the thickness of the glove is fixed by the dip. So you'll get it even. It feels good as a as just gray. But when you put the yellow dip on it, it puts back the, what you've taken away with the thickness of this glove. Okay. So as a procedure, if you like a knife, you want to change your handle, you can do something like this. All right, this is a super, super secret technique. Uh, if you think about what uh, OT, occupational therapy, my uncle had arthritis, bad hands, couldn't pick up a butter knife. So I jammed one of these on, wedged it to his wonky hand, spreading butter and stuff all the time, no problem. So it's a, it's a system that could work this way as well. Patrick, as a, you know, as a body guy, have you noticed when you shuck a lot of oysters, yep. the pain up it's, here? It's the rotator cuff. Is that what it yeah. is? Tennis elbow, rotator cuff. People right. always ask whether it's going to be the, the wrist, uh, carpal tunnel. The wrist is fine. Pretty, yeah. pretty standard. It doesn't really move the wrist as you're shucking. I notice um, after we have a big rally, and we'll shuck uh, six, seven hundred oysters in an hour. And I notice after that hour, eh, a couple of weeks in, you start to feel it right up in the top part of your shoulder. So let's just start. Right, squish it in. Thank you, Wood. Not particularly hard, but no, I'm just, yeah. Let's see. This feels 
so momentous, right? I mean, this is talk about a tool fetish. This for a second. I'm just gonna feel it. I know it's soft still. I wanna sort of get this. talking about oysters I, I think the thing you know it's easy to talk about the shucking the knife and everything but the thing I like best about oysters and I'm sure um, Patrick and I share this is well, it, just how um, how much of a social um, occasion oysters always are you know they're always the life of the party there there's just something about being the guy in the room who can chuck an oyster and you show up with a box of oysters, it just somehow, it always becomes a good East Coast party. And, and that's just something we really treasure. And one of my favorite things to do is teach people how to shuck. And just like Patrick, you know, developed a bit of a pattern. And, you know, and this is freaking hot as shit, I'm just saying. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and you sort, of, you sort of focus on the things, the insight, the, the moments that, uh, that matter when you're shucking. This is looking good. It's gonna oh, be more. Shit. It's gonna more. It's a little more grubby. I'm still not really pressing. Hard no, 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 no. It's good because it's hot, guys. Okay. Let's. Uh, let's move. Yeah, it's almost fine. Right. Give you a little relief. So you're gonna get one that's actually pretty grippy. How many do you think you've made of these over the years? Uh, this style, custom for for people. Really, only about 80 or so. See, it's already set in the, in the sense that it's already got that shape. Now, this will take, it's, it's, it, won't, it won't move any further if you, if you squish it. Yeah. Just squish it. Put it in there. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's not moving. Nope. Which is great, because now we can cure it. So that, oof, you, done? you can pull that off. How does it feel? Feels good. I yeah. had a, uh, I had a day last summer. Oh, it just blew up. Where after well, 20 years, I broke the tip a little bit. So I was down for a couple of days without it. We had to sort of shave the tip down a little bit. And so it was like three or four days where it wasn't quite dialed in. What a sucky baby I was. Right? Like, I can't hold Patrick's uh, custom ones. Well, I can hold the custom. I can't hold the, the normal ones. My hand's just a little too big. The Oxos work great, though. And Oxos they are. is an excellent oyster knife. We, we use them all the time. They're our base knife. Give them away, that sort of thing. But, eh, you know, I was probably 20% slower than I wanted to be. And you'd, I think you'd have to shape those tips though too. And I yeah, found that the oxo, fatter, the, the oxo blade tends to torque too. If it, it's not as hard as I would like it to be. Sure. That's just a me thing. Well, it's a, it's the quality of the thing, of the steel that they're using. Yeah. Could be different. Okay. So it's going to be funkier. That's for sure. But it, it looks very similar. Yeah. Can I take it down? Well, to the last one. Had those last lines one. and everything. I'm glad you have a picture of it. We can't quite find one. Oh, I'll send this Lots to you. Lots of pictures of me with it, but yep. none of the knife itself. Mm. That knife went all over the world, shuck oysters everywhere. We're getting ready to shuck oysters on the Great Wall of China. <laughs> Stuff like that. Why aren't you opening? Oh, cancel. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna tune it up, finish it. If you wanted to take a look around, show the labs or whatnot, and maybe grab a coffee. Sure. And then I'll do a dippy dip sure, after this, and we'll yeah. go from there.
Super. Would you like me to stay? We'll keep the conversation going. Absolutely. This, this class is restaurant management. This is restaurant management. How do you, how do you manage your situation? Because you, as a, a manager, very seasonal. You close your restaurant. Is it closed right now? We're closed right now. And that's, why is that? We operate six months a year because two reasons. A, that's the industry on Prince Edward Island. We don't have tourists in the winter. And B, that's when our farm gives us vegetables. And we, we do have a eight acre vegetable farm. We grow more than 300 different things. And, and we do literally grow what we serve. If we don't grow it, we don't serve it. So we are limited to our farm season. Having said that, we often say, that's our secret sauce. The idea that we can take the winters off, stand down a bit. It's not that we stop working, but we take out of our world that energy that, and when you're performing at the level we are, um, I'm not quite Michelin star level, but certainly up there, you know, Canada's 100th best, one of the most expensive restaurants in the country, and it's $235 just for the food. I mean, clearly we're up to something and, you know, and, and what's, what's normal in our industry is when you're executing at that level, you're normally tied to a downtown 12 month real estate deal. And you're forced to do the thing 12 months indefinitely, it never stops. And, you know, as we all know in this room, our industry has gone through a bit of a crisis the last few years. It's gone through a transformation is perhaps, I think, a better way of putting it. And our expectations have changed dramatically on what work is and what it should give to us. And, and so as a manager of the restaurant, that becomes our single biggest challenge without question. It's, Growing vegetables is easy. Lighting 15 fires a day is easy. Managing now 96 people on staff last summer to the degree that we now have a full-time HR director working for us. Those are the issues. Uh, and those are the things that we should all be talking about. Um, and of course, in our world, nine years into this business, in our second season, um, I threw tips out, got rid of them, and brought hospitality included into the business. And no that allowed me, within in that second year, right away, we were able to start giving every single person on our staff the exact same benefits that my family has, and a whole suite of other things as well. Uh, made for transparency, it made for a better work environment. We did it across the board, and it just plain worked. I'm very proud of that. Um, we kept learning more and more lessons, and then two years ago, 2020 um, was very challenging, of course. 2021 broke us, though, because we had tragedy in our business. And it really exposed a lot of raw ends, a lot of um, things that just didn't work anymore about our industry. And, and this is coming from somebody, we were already doing everything right. Like we were already taking care of our staff, no tips, this, that, and the other thing, everything was great. But then one of our sous chefs, was in a massive car wreck and he's now a quadriplegic. And so that really fucked us up. It really did, brought everything to the surface, uh, created a very challenging season. We ended the year in fine form, we got the job done. And at the end of the year, and this is one of the benefits to seasonal operation, I was able to sit back, think hard, and I realized that, well, in our level of business, our staff, our core culinary team, they have to work a 12 hour day, sometimes more. That's just how it is. There's no way around it. But I finally realized that I do have one more variable under my control, and that is how many days a week the staff works. So starting last year, we started working our core culinary team just four days a week. The business runs seven days a week, but our team only works four days a week. We didn't dock their pay, we didn't take anything away, we gave them an extra day, and let me tell you, of everything that I, I have ever done managing a business, that is by far the single most effective and best choice I have ever made for the team around me. Four day work week. Four day work week. I cannot overstate what a game changer that was. Um, what a massive increase in productivity, spirit, passion, not being burned out at the end of your four days, and then not wasting a full day of your precious time off just to recover, 
only to spend the next day in fear of going back to work. Instead, having three full days off. You know, coming back to work with stories of the time you spent on Prince Edward Island and, and how much fun you had, re getting your act together, whatever. It's, it's something I'm extraordinarily proud of. We're gonna keep on doing it, you know, taking care of our team. So, you know, I could go on and on and on and on. And, you know, managing restaurants, um, you've heard all the platitudes, you know, pay attention to those pennies if you want the dollars to be there, so to speak. But as, as no doubt you've also learned and heard, HR will be, without question, the biggest single challenges that we all deal with, without question. And at this point, you know, in your career, and knowing that lots of people are listening, you know, I call bullshit on the idea that there's skill shortage out there, that there's not enough people to work in our business. That's operators that haven't faced the facts yet, that haven't said to themselves, we need to do better. We need to change the way we do business and stop using it as an excuse. Oh, pandemic, oh, there's nobody out there working. Fact is, the restaurant industry was wildly exploited for a very long time. And this idea that somehow going out into a dining room and spending, you know, buku dollars to enjoy yourself in a fancy dining room while in the back of the house are exploited human beings, the end does not justify the means. It just doesn't work anymore. And so with all that in mind, you know, we've had to change. We've had to change very quickly. And I say we as an industry, you know, I'm, I'm very happy and lucky that at our business, we were already there in so many ways. But these are all about you and your expectations and what you should expect from your career moving forward. And, and if you're not getting that learning experience, if you're not being seen, if you're not respected, then you should leave. You should quit and move on. You should not waste a single ounce of your energy on working for anybody who does not see you or respect you, honor you, or see your integrity each and every day. That's how it should be. You know, When we, we look at what happened in the States uh, recently, the National Restaurant Association, they're supposed to be our, our industry advocate. The same things happen here in Canada, Restaurants Canada. In both cases, Restaurants Canada and the NRA in the States, both cases, the number one advocates in Canada and in the States for keeping minimum wage down. Restaurants Canada, out there taking your dues, your money, and working their asses off to make sure that minimum wage stays down. The NRA got busted doing that in the States a few weeks ago using everybody's membership fees, all the workers, all the union dues, everybody who working their asses off, contributing, taking that money, turning around and working hard to keep minimum wage down. So folks, you gotta fight for yourselves, you know, and your expectations matter. And boy, I could go all day. <laughs> Look at that dripping away, huh? This is what happens. So, you know, coming up with and, and helping understand those ideas of management. You had those great questions about tips, et cetera. And, and this is where I think things should be moving towards as well, the fair living wage. Uh, each restaurant is going to be different though as well and how things work out that way. And it's sometimes going to be slow, but you, you know, chef, you have that. And I said this to a bunch of chefs since, since pandemic, there's an opportunity to open up with new, new ideas, new, new ways of doing things, yes. uh, which this is encouraging because you've got the inn. It's, it's really just, like I said, it's a playground of food. Uh, and showcase of locality, sustainability, and then people just having a, a good time. Chef puts on a show every single day. You, you're like there every day, yeah? I try to be, except yeah. Sundays, that's my except, day That's off. right, your day off, I that's remember. Yeah. Six days a week. But, yeah, but yeah. Uh, putting on the show and everything like that is, is great stuff. Uh, and thank you, thank you for that. Do you, you guys have any questions for Chef? You're okay right now. Uh, this is gonna dry for a couple minutes. Sure. If you wanted to go and check out the labs. I mean, can you can you show sure. them around the labs? I mean, Thank show them the, I'll let this dry. I'll carry on with my lecture, and you know, we'll see maybe in about thirty minutes or so, thirty forty. We'll yeah. go from there. Okay. Okay. So yeah, what it is is just sort of it's a liquid, and then it just drips, yep. dries, and then what you'll do later on is you'll you'll see there's a little right just there. cut that little knob off. Just yeah. use a little sharpie. Mine just take had, that off. I, I had used mine so much that I had worn off the yellow over the years and Patrick graciously offered to every single time he saw me use it he's like I'll fix that for you I'm like no 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 those battle scars I, I, I don't yeah it's that. the showcase of, of where it's been yeah. uh, when you see this one here this one I've only used uh, I use this for the Guinness book so I've used it only twice 
really. Uh, but it's taken all this stuff off because I just went that hard at it. Yeah. You know, it just wears off on the tip. Help. So what I've done here, uh, using epoxy glue now, uh, so I glue this so water seal. Sure. And then uh, an added bonus added layer underneath the plastic. So. Right on. That's it. That's how you make a knife. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. That's how you talk to a chef. <laughs> That's how you listen. No, thank you, you chef. We'll talk to you. Yeah, man. So yeah, we're just gonna let that drip dry. I'll just uh, we'll go from there.